Good evening to everyone. I have a privilege to host uh, Arvind Raogaru today. Our topic today would be Bharti scriptures and overview of our knowledge systems. And uh, just to give a small uh, brief introduction at a high level for Mr. Arvind Raogaru. He's IPS retired as, as a general uh, director general of police, United uh, Andhra Pradesh State. He served as an additional D uh, DGP for State of Intelligence and Additional Commissioner of Police, Hyderabad, IGP Greyhounds, and IGP Crime Investigation Department. He is very well known for his administration, aspect, basically. And uh, most interesting, interesting aspect, which is most relevant to him, I'm just speaking of this, is that he holds a doctorate in Sanskrit and has authored several books on Sanatan Dharma. Renowned for his uh, sincerity and simplicity, Dr. Arvind Rao Garu has developed a keen interest in studying Sanatan Dharma during his service itself parallelly. And this led him to pursue masters in Sanskrit. And subsequently, he has done doctorate also under the ages of uh, Guru Padma Shri Pulala Ramchandra Garu and uh, Maha Opadhyay. And he is uh, anti Sri Tatvan Swamiji. Dr. Anand Garu developed a deep understanding on Sanatan Dharma. Vedanta, Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Sutras, and Bhashyas. Post his retirement, has authored several books in Telugu and English, besides a book on analysis of Ingram of Upanishads in Sanskrit. He has also deeply adeptly woven ancient Vedic wisdom with practical knowledge and rendered several online lectures on various subjects relating to Advaita, Shankara Bhashyam, Upanishads, and Bhagavad Gita, to name few has been uh, a recipient of several awards and was also known, conferred with his honorary title of Vachaspati by Rashtri Vidya Pitam. It's a deemed a university of uh, government of uh, India for his valuable services in field of Sanskrit uh, studies. That's a brief about Arvind Rao Garu. Uh, sir, uh, over to you uh, for your presentation. So thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Umam Rao Garu. And uh, thank you, Mr. Modi. Modi ji, so I can I can call somebody Mr. Modi. Hmm? So I'm happy. So today I am asked to speak about the hierarchy of Hindu texts. So this is a very important subject. So we we often hear the one comment which is made on us <coughs> that the Abrahamic religions they say that they are the people of the book. So they are the people of the book means they have only one book that is the Bible or the Quran and then they follow it. Whereas we are having lot many books. So that is why one Swamiji, Dayananda Saraswati, he said, we are not people of the book, but we are people of the library because we have got so many books. So, but then that is our problem also. So that is the reason why we do not know which, which book is important and which book is not important. Somebody reads Ramayana, somebody reads Mahavarta, somebody reads Lalita Sarsanama, somebody else reads some other Sarsanama. So everybody thinks that he is uh, doing the right thing. And actually so, it is rightly so. But still, we will not be having a complete idea, a bird's eye view of the whole uh, picture. So that is what we have. We have, our problem is. So we all we all know what is um, say so and so goddess. We all know what is Krishna. We all know what is Rama, etc., etc. But then, if somebody asks a question, what is your idea of God? How many gods you, do you have? Is there only one God or so many gods? So we will not be having a correct idea of what exactly is our representative text. So that is that is the reason why we are supposed to know uh, the hierarchy, basically the hierarchy of texts. So I will just show this presentation. So the question, the questions we encounter are uh, which text is greater, etc. Whether we can read this and also the other. Somebody asks, can I read Lalita Sahasranama and also read uh, something else like Vishnu Sahasranama or Shiva Sahasranama? And uh, now there are some words like Shruti and Smruti. And which are the oldest texts? We all know that the oldest texts are the Vedas. And that is called the Shruti. It is called Shruti means Shravanam. We all know that Shravanam means listening. And Shruti is something which is heard. So that is uh, according to tradition. If we ask a traditional, uh, highly traditional person, he will say that it is actually revealed to the Rishis. It is actually revealed to the Rishis by Brahma himself. So they just heard it. So, what, okay, in modern terms, we can say that in their deep state of contemplation, or in a state of deep contemplation, they had a revelation of certain truths, some universal truths, and that is what they called it Shruti. And they are the primary texts. And based on these primary texts, 
the some other texts have also come they are called this brupi and uh, regarding this primary text uh, the vedas uh, coming to that they were transmitted orally from teacher to student it is called the shruti parampara from teacher to student is that is shruti parampara they were not written down till uh, max muller uh, got them uh, printed and all that so till that time they were coming from father to son father to son or teacher to student so that in that parampara it has come and they were also classified by sage vyasa that was in the dwapara yuga you know that sage vyasa was in dwapara yuga at that time they were classified uh, prior to that it seems they were all almost uh, in a, a one big mass of um, say suktas and the things like that so he classified them according to uh, a particular method for example all the suktas sukta is for example agni sukta it is something which is uh, a hymn to agni or bhu suktam a hymn to bhumi saraswati suktam a hymn to saraswati purusha suktam it is a sort of visualization of the whole universe as one cosmic entity uh, as one organic entity so that is purusha sukta purusha sukta means it is visualizing the whole universe as one organic entity and seeing what is man's place in that so like that various visualizations are there various suktas are there some so they are put into one category and then again there are certain things which relate to yajna etc some other things relate to some other practical aspects of um, ordinary life that is a king how a king has to be coronated etc they go to atharva veda so he divided these things according to certain um, depending on the subject in that rigveda yajurveda sama and atharva veda these are the most primary texts and rigveda is said to be the oldest record of mankind at least some 5000 years old and these this rigveda suktas they also include a philosophical inquiry philosophical inquiry means for example uh, there is one sukta called nasadiya sukta many of you might have heard about nasadiya sukta purusha sukta itself that is the most popular sukta is purusha sukta and also a slightly controversial sukta because it talks about brahman brahmano samakamasi etc so the, these suktas they have they, they want to understand they want to understand the whole cosmos they want to understand what is reality what is the cause what is the ultimate cause for all this uh, manifestation so they, there is a philosophical inquiry in all these things then we come to uh yeah the same primary text the contents of the vedas are seen in two parts or three parts or sometimes in four parts that is what is called karma kanda and gnana kanda for example karma vedas they are talk broadly called karma kanda and gnana kanda karma kanda means all this yajna etc how this yajna has to be performed and in that yajna what sort of sukta has to be studied etc and gnana kanda is uh, i mean that relates to upanishad that is one classification there are different classifications of the vedas um, some people they classify in i mean if we want to classify only into two we say karma kanda and gnana kanda three parts if we want to classify karma kanda upasana kanda and gnana kanda and four parts if we want to classify they say karma kanda first is samhita brahmanam aranyakam and upanishad samhita brahmanam aranyakam and upanishad basically samhita portion only some suktas Brahmanam is an elaboration of those suktas, some sort of commentary on those suktas, how they have to be applied, etc. And Aranyakam, slightly philosophical speculation that starts from there. And Upasana, what we call Upasana or meditation, starts from there. And Upanishads, they are mostly philosophical um, debates or discussions. So these are uh, we can sometimes they are classified. Vedas are classified in two or three or sometimes four parts. It doesn't matter. and the initial portions of the vedas they are about religious rites such as yajna the middle portions talk about the meditations enabling a person to think at a higher level they are called the upasana kanda the end portions which are called the upanishads or vedanta include philosophical inquiry into the nature of ultimate reality and uh, there is no agenda to start a religion one thing we have to notice is that they don't have any agenda upanishads they don't have any agenda to start a religion basically it is an inquiry into the nature of reality so that is what we see upanishads they are not written by one person in fact all these vedas there are hundreds of um, uh, sages and hundreds of sages so some of them are uh, brahmins and some of them were kshatriyas and some of them some other campaign people also we just do not know who they are it is not as though it is a brahminical literature uh, why i am making this observation is nowadays it is also a very controversial subject so there are lot many kings in fact if we see upanishads there are cases where a brahmin boy goes to uh, learn brahma vidya from a kshatriya so there are upan there are ch- chapters like that in chandogya upanishad for example uh, there is uh, i mean one sage he sends his son to the king and then that king teaches him brahma vidya 
so like that in those days there was no i mean uh, specific division about um, this brahmana kshatriya etc there were mostly mingled up intermingled and uh, it is a product of the whole community we can say but then what is the greatness of these upanishads the greatness of the upanishads is that they are basically a, 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 a rational enquiry into the nature of reality and they start with uh, observing the observer i think i can explain i should explain it uh, that is for example a student goes to his father a, a sage a young boy goes to his father and he asks oh my dear father you tell me what is the supreme reality then the father says i can't just like that tell you you have to think on your own it is not as though i tell and you listen you have to think on your own and then he also gives a sort of framework what are, what is the material you have what is the equipment which you have with you what is the equipment which we have we have only one mind and five senses five senses are there five sense organs and five motor organs are there there is a physical body there is a prana body so annam pranam chakshu srotram mano vacham iti he says you have got an annamaya kosha you have got a pranamaya kosha you have got a manomaya kosha and with this thing only you have to think tapasa brahma vijignyasa swa that is tapasa brahma vijignyasa swa means you have to know the truth by tapas tapas means tapas the actual literal meaning of tapas is to think you have to think you have to contemplate and then know what is the reality and then you look into yourself what exactly is your primary uh, nature are you the body are you the mind are you uh, the prana shakti what what exactly are you so he, the boy goes and then he thinks and then he comes out comes out with one answer and then the father says no you think further you think further so like that observing the observer is something which is unique to hinduism then then upanishads somebody you must have heard about arthur schopenhauer is a german philosopher he said in the whole world there is no study so beneficial and so elevating as that of the upanishads it has been the solace of my life and it will be the solace of my death they are the product of the highest wisdom so he was one philosopher not only he there are lot many philosophers but he was one of the first philosophers uh, european philosophers who was influenced by the upanishadic philosophy and uh, later lot many people like um, uh, uh, say um, emerson ralph waldo emerson of america uh, and david thoreau of america many people were deeply influenced by uh, upanishadic philosophy then the next thing is the secondary texts the secondary texts are they are of three types itihasa purana and dharma shastra when we talk about primary texts the most primary texts are the vedas and in that vedas what we saw was there is one portion relating to karma karma kanda means performance of yajnas and all that the other portion relating to meditation and also about what is the nature of reality what is the nature of highest reality and finally what is the nature of highest reality it is not some god who is sitting somewhere in heaven the ultimate reality is according to upanishads it is what is called satyam jnana anantam brahma one upanishad says it is satyam jnana anantam brahma that is in english we have to say infinitely existing consciousness infinitely existing consciousness is the actual translation of the phrase so that is what he is manifesting as this whole universe so that is what upanishad says it is not in our philosophy in our upanishadic philosophy there is no particular person called god who is sitting somewhere in heaven it is only pure consciousness which is uh, pervading all pervading consciousness and that consciousness is manifesting as all what all we see and all the god forms which we visualize whether it is brahma vishnu ishvara all these things are forms which are visualized in that uh, consciousness so that is what our siddhanta our doctrine says so when that is the doctrine then what about this doctrine cannot be told cannot be i mean i mean a common man cannot be cannot understand all these things so for the common man whatever god he is following okay the the sages they said okay it is allowed for all these you know, people so that is the reason why they created other secondary literature called itihasa purana and dharma shastra itihasa we all know that there are two texts only that is ramayana and mahabharata they are the two itihasa itihasa means iti uh, ha asa iti ha asa that is how it is divided iti means thus ha it is, it is said so asa means it was it seems it was like that so that is the meaning of it itihasa itihasa means it seems it was like that so that is they have heard some story about mahabharata and then somebody has related and somebody has written down so that is itihasa that is a semi history we can say it is semi historical uh, why, why i am saying it semi historical is there are certain supernatural elements uh, supernatural things which we see in those itihasas 
some people may believe in that and some people may not believe in that if i say that all that is itihasa uh, then it is hard for a it is hard for a modern man to believe in that so we can say some it is actually a historical story but then slightly uh, we can say um, uh, idealized or uh, some uh, some supernatural element has been added to that we do not know so that is itihasa purana is mostly what we call mythology purana is my micro mythology and uh, that is all the gods whom we see they uh, 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 hear about that is ganesha saraswati brahma vishnu maheshwara all the gods and goddesses all devi now we are having this devi saptashati this uh, devi navaratri so all these things all these gods goddesses etc they are all told in that purana why this itihasa and purana are, are written sage vyasa gives a sort of formula in Mahabharata. Mahabharata in the very first chapter he says, Itihasa Purana Abhyam Vedam Samupa Brumhayat, he says. That is, whatever has been told in the Veda, that is the philosophy of the Veda, has to be communicated to the modern to the common man through some uh, uh, story and through some, in some some form, in the form of some sort of uh, mythological uh, story, etc. So Itihasa and Purana are there to try to transmit whatever is there in that Vedas to the common man. So they tell all that which is there in the Veda. For example, I told you about the nature of that supreme reality. The nature of supreme reality is that Satyam, Yana, Manantam, Brahma, infinitely existing consciousness. All that thing is communicated in ordinary language, in the form of a story to the common man. So all that technical big, big words, they are avoided. And in very simple terms, it is conveyed to the common man. So this is what Itihasa and Purana, they do. And Dharma Shastra, it is only about a sort of moral code. Dharma, we know what is Dharma, Dharana, the Dharma Vichyate, that which holds the society from breaking apart is what is Dharma. Dharma is a dru, dru means to, to hold, to hold, to bear. So there is uh, that which holds the society from falling apart is Dharma. And of course, there are a lot many big, big definitions about Dharma, what is Dharma, etc. With Vaddhi, Sevita, Sadhi, Nitya, Madhvesha, Ragivihi, there is a big definition given by Manu. I will not go into that. So, Dharma Shastra is, most, is basically an ethical text. For example, there is Manu Dharma Shastra, Yajna Valka Smriti, Parashara Smriti, and so many other Smritis. They are also called Smritis. Uh, in fact, Itihasa, Purana, and Dharma Shastra, all three are also called Smriti. Smriti is uh, something which is uh, recalled to memory. Shruti is something which is heard. Shruti means Veda. Only Veda, Veda means including Upanishad, it is called Shruti. Whereas Smriti is something which is recalled. Whatever has been told in the uh, uh, Shruti, it is recalled. And in the light of that, what is told in the Shruti, you are formulating something new. You are writing something new. In the light of whatever is told in the Shruti, you are writing certain Dharma, you are writing an ethical code. So that is what is Dharma Shastra. So Itihasa, Purana, and Dharma Shastra are collectively called Shruti. Then, uh, sorry, Smruti. So this uh, Ramayana and Mahabharata, as I said, they are semi historical. Uh, characters are uh, live or uh, their uh, what did I say? Not live examples. Okay, then also see they are live examples of the ideals mentioned in the Vedas. Uh, the Itihasas they give a grand cultural vision for the society. Then secondary texts continued. Uh, the Vedas they are illustrated through Itihasa and Purana stories, sometimes allegorical and symbolic. For example, allegorical stories. If we use, uh, right now. If we see the Devi Saptashati, recently in Hans India, only this last Sunday, there was an article of mine on uh, the symbolism in the three stories which are there in Devi Saptashati. There are three stories. The first story is about how a person has to conquer uh, Tamoguna. We know that there is Sattvaguna, Rajoguna, Tamoguna. Uh, the first story is about the conquering of Sattva, uh, Tamoguna. The second story is about conquering of Rajoguna. The third story is about conquering of, conquering means going beyond the Sattvaguna also. Suppose I stay in Satvaguna, even staying in Satvaguna is not correct. You have to go beyond that also. We have beyond that also and totally lose my personality. So only then I become one with that Brahman. So that is how uh, the, the spiritual process goes. So there, 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 there is a symbolism in most of these uh, stories. And they are also illustrated by the Dharma Shastras, which are code of ethics. Then again, there, as I said, Marusmati, Parashara Smriti, etc. There are roughly 40 odd uh, Smritis of um, i mean uh, written by various sages at various times in various places so which means shruti what is told in the smriti i mean shruti about the nature of highest reality that does not change whereas 
the man's conduct depending on the time depending on the time, depending on the place situation it changes so that is how shankaracharya in one place says whatever is applicable in one time one place in one context is not applicable in another time another place another context um the, the one why in one place whatever is called dharma it may not be dharma in some other place so in in fact in one upanishad also it says upanishad also is a saitiriya upanishad there is a beautiful line which says atha yadi te dharma vichikitsa va vrutta vichikitsa va asyat e tatra brahmana sammarsina so it goes on like that so there it, the meaning is when you go to a new place you have to see the conduct of the people who, the, the not only the elderly people those who are committed to truth aluksha dharma kama shyo it says dharma kama that is some the people who are abiding by dharma so you observe people who who are there and then whatever they do that becomes the dharma there so if you have any doubt about the dharma if you go to some other place you have to follow that so dharma change this uh, changes from time to time depending on for example now there is a lot of techno there are lot many technological changes and in fact there is a need for a modern smriti also there is a need for smriti you you might have heard about one swami ji called uh, sada shivananda murti kandukur shivananda murti so in fact he requested my guru ji that is kolala sri ramachandra to to write a new smriti for modern times in fact he wrote also he wrote also and he sent to various um, pitams he wrote a smriti called kaundinya smriti but unfortunately our pitadipatis and religious leaders they don't take a decision about what to do so anyway they have not taken any decision on that so we definitely need a modern smriti because in the absence of a modern smriti people will say oh you are having that modern smriti you are supposed to do this if somebody some shudra listens to veda you have to pour some oil into oil into his ears so all those things uh, they accuse us and manusmriti was one text which was never followed which was not even known to us not know. all this all this orthodox brahmins they were only following some other ordinary books like the dharma sindhu nirnaya sindhu etc but unfortunately that william, william jones uh, he identified that manusmriti he said yes manusmriti is your text so some 5000 year old text and then he made also in all types of attributions to hindus oh you are like this you are like this so anyway study of vedas would be complete only by studying this later text vyasa statement okay vyasa statement i said so if you see that uh, if you call or rather if you compare vedas to a text uh, the law textbook the itihasa and purana they are like the case law law and case law in that case law you have got certain uh, examples about how exactly uh, a person for example satyam vada says one one veda if veda says satyam vada then manchara etc then what are the live examples then they give the examples of harishchandra they give the examples of uh, some shibhi chakravarti or ranti deva or some such people so these are this is somewhat like a case then again we see puranas are mythological in nature there is uh, there is an element of supernatural they are mostly symbolic allegorical in nature in nature there are 18 major puranas and some secondary puranas also then vishnu purana shiva purana agni purana skanda etc are the major puranas they integrated various um, various uh, traditions in vedic framework uh, what uh, scholars say is that uh, the traditional view is that all the 18 puranas are written by sage vyasa one person called sage vyasa but many traditional scholars also agree that all these things they are not written by only one man vyasa is actually a sort of title and uh, many people for example i belong to vishnu tradition i write one vishnu purana and somebody else belongs to shiva tradition he writes some shiva purana and in that the upanishadic uh, uh, philosophy is embedded in that upanishadic philosophy that is the highest reality that is supreme reality that consciousness the shuddha chaitanya that shuddha chaitanya is manifesting in that no it is having a power called maya and because of that maya the whole universe is emerging so that that content is there philosophy is same whereas instead of saying shuddha chaitanya i say vishnu somebody else say, says shiva somebody else will say ganesha so like that i will fit i take that upanishadic vedanta upanishadic whatever uh, doctrine is there in that upanishad and i fit it into my hierarchy so vishnu purana has got a hierarchy different from what is shown in shiva purana or in, in some other purana devi devi bhagavatam if you see devi bhagavatam you see a different hierarchy so hierarchy of gods differs from purana to purana so they probably allowed all these traditions to coexist they allowed all the all our sages uh, they said okay you 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 are following this vishnu tradition 
you follow you consider vishnu as the supreme reality and somebody else is a follower of shiva you okay you follow you consider shiva as the supreme reality so they allowed all these traditions to coexist so they harmonized various traditions in very framework when they contributed to the cultural unity of india then dharma shastras as i said manusmriti that is the oldest text and there is one shloka which says that manusmriti was relevant in kata yuga uh, there is a shloka which says kartav tu manava dharma tretayam tretayam narada smriti dwapare shankhali kitav the dwapara in the kata yuga manava dharma hamis manu manusmriti then the tretayam uh, narada smriti in treta yuga narada there is a smriti called narada narada smriti dwapare shankhali kitav in dwapara yuga there is a there was there is a smriti called shankhali kita parashara smriti kalau parashara smriti there is one shloka like that and parashara smriti uh, it has been commented upon by several people parashara madhaviyam there is one uh, commentary by sage vidyaranya it is called parashara madhaviyam so that is all these texts are available so these are uh, changing from time to time in one text you find uh, a particular um, uh, say procedure in another text you find some other some relaxation and in some old texts they are more they we see some more liberal things in old texts for example manusmriti talks about widow remarriage most of most of us we don't know that <laughs> manusmriti talks about widow remarriage but later texts they don't talk in old in olden uh, days even women they used to perform sandhya vandana and uh, later text the women are not doing they are not studying veda they are not doing sandhya vandana etc and according to manusmriti who we are supposed to a brahmin is supposed to offer meat to uh, the bhaktas during shraddha time suppose i perform the shraddha of my father i have to offer meat <coughs> and preferably uh, that is a deer deer meat deer is supposed to be the dearest to the forefathers so all these things we have never followed maybe thousands of years ago we have given it up but then manusmriti is still held against us as the representative text so uh, but then the later texts later texts also the, they also talk about this uh, this business of uh, offering meat during uh, uh, shraddha so if you see this uh, dharma shastras you find lot many uh, things which we have never heard of in uh, practice then philosophical con- concepts do not do not change but human relations have to be redefined then again what are our doctrinal texts when we come to we have heard to uh, we saw what are the primary texts and what are secondary texts but we can also see what are the texts which contain the doctrine or canonical texts as we say the upanishads they contain the doctrine the brahma sutras they contain the doctrine and bhagavad gita not only bhagavad gita there are some other, some other texts also for example ashtavakra gita or some other gita like sanasujadiyam there are some other texts but traditionally these three are considered to be what is called there is a name collectively called prasthana traya prasthana traya so if you want to know what is our doctrine you should not go to some shiva purana or vishnu purana or linga purana or some other skanda purana or any other purana if you read bhagavad if you read uh, say uh, ramayana or bhagavata you only get only a part of it but you want to, if you want to know the pure undiluted uncolored uncolored means suppose i go to shiva purana it, it has got a shiva color i go to vishnu purana it has got vishnu color so if i don't if i want something which is totally uncolored undiluted and unadulterated vedanta i have to go to upanishads only upanishads and brahma sutras what is this brahma sutras brahma sutras are uh, they are said to have been written by one person called badarayana we don't know whether it is badarayana or sage vyasa some people say it is sage vyasa some people say it is a different person but whoever it was it is a marvelous work brahma sutras why it is a marvelous work means for the first time various apparently contradicting statements of the upanishads have been taken and then their uh, their apparent contradictions have been sorted out and it was established that there is a unity of thought in all these upanishadic lines basically all these upanishads suppose one upanishad says something another upanishad says something there is no clarity but then brahma sutras they have analyzed all those statements in this particular context this this is this is what it means in some other context this is what it means so they sort out all these differences plus they also examine various um, uh, points relating to the supreme reality for example god can he be a factionist to to say can god be an imperialist for example in abrahamic religions god is an imperialist he says you go and kill people 
can god do that so that is the question so there is an adhikarana there is a particular chapter for that there is a particular um, uh, section which debates which debates and then says god when you say god it is not somebody as i said it is not a person there is no it is something which is which is going beyond everything so it is it does not have any sort of favoritism it does not love it doesn't hate anybody it is something which is above everything so god does not give any any such instructions in fact bhagavad gita says god what you call god does not take away your sin he does not take away your merit also nadatte kasya chit papam achaiva sukrutam vibhu he doesn't take away your sin he doesn't take away your merit he is not not concerned with what you do agyane na avartham loke all these things is due to agyana that you think that god is taking away all these things so god means something which is totally unconnected with all these things in fact god has nothing to do with the world also the highest level if we talk about vedanta so this brahma sutras are uh, they, they are they, they pose various questions what is god can can there be a form to god form means what we call saguna can there be a form name etc to god uh, then again uh, can there be attributes is god can god be called a creator so if god is a creator from where does he create what is the material for him what is the if somebody wants to make something there is what is called a material cause material the for example if a potter wants to make a pot the clay is the material cause and this potter is the instrumental cause so like that there what is the instrumental cause and what is the material cause and all those things come into picture so all these debates they take place in that they occur in that brahma sutras bhagavad gita of course we we all know we all know that uh, it summarizes bhagavad gita if you want to read the book i strongly recommend to you please don't read the book kindly listen to some teacher and uh, nowadays i am advising all the people to listen to one swami ji called sarva priyananda if you have not heard his name kindly note his name sarva priyananda he is uh, in the vedanta society of california uh, so sarva priyananda if you go to youtube sarva priyananda gita so there are uh, about 120 odd uh, talks 120 talks on bhagavad gita starting from uh, chapter 1 to chapter 10 only in that particular series um, so kindly listen to that kindly listen to bhagavad gita by swami sarva priyananda so they give uh, say what exactly the modern man wants modern man needs rather so uh, what all we are supposed to know uh, how many gods we have for example how many gods we have what is our uh, idea of highest reality what is the meaning of varna and what is caste so all these things uh, we have to listen from a teacher who has studied the commentaries one who has not studied the commentaries he cannot tell anything so there are many people there may be many people who are talking about uh, gita but then a person who has not studied commentaries he will not be able to say anything so anyway the these three books they are collectively called prasthana traya prasthana means path they are not three different paths but then they are paths to the same reality that no three different paths means one is shruti pra, shruti upanishad is called shruti prasthanam shruti means the veda this is called uh, uh nyaya prasthanam nyaya means by means of logic this is smruti prasthanam smruti prasthanam nyaya prasthanam it is called sma prasthana traya so these three books give the philosophical doctrine around which all traditions got shaped so if you take bhagavad gita bhagavad gita is interpreted by you know non dual tradition it is interpreted by vishishta advaita tradition uh, interpreted by madhva tradition and so many other traditions so then major commentators like shankara ramanuja etc they have commented on these things then again another classification okay this is not not needed this again i have already taken half an hour then another classification is what is called religious beliefs etc the higher knowledge lower knowledge mudha upanishads say that those who are content with rituals etc they are all fools <laughs> so those who do those who perform yagna etc and who are content with that they are all that is a lower knowledge they are all fools they are the mudhas they say then again there are persons who, yeah if you do not know your if you don't strive to know what is your real self that is atma gyana then the person who does not um, strive to know atma gyana he is committing atma hatya they say atma ha it says atma ha means one who kills his own atma so a person who does not know atma is somebody who is killing his atma that means in the sense that he is again caught in the cycle of birth and death he doesn't get he doesn't uh, get liberated from the cycle of birth and death so in that way he is killing himself so he is killing his atma by not knowing it so like that they have got very strong words 
for people who are content with rituals. Then uh, understanding Puranas, yeah, Puranas. Puranas means again, mm, uh, yeah, this symbolizing the battle for a battle between good and evil. Yeah, this Purana, Shankaracharya makes a comment. When you talk about gods and demons, gods and demons are not people who are there somewhere in the sky. Gods are your own refined pravrutti. That is Devaha Shastrod Bhasita Indriya Vrutaya, he says. Shastrod Bhasita Indriya Vrutaya means our own actions, which are purified by the study of Shastras. They are the Devas. And the contrary are the Tad, tad Viparita, Asuraha Tad Viparita. Contrary to that, those who are not, not refined by the study of Shastras, that is, we have never studied Shastras, we have not known refinement. So our activities, our actions, they are the Asuras. And the Devasura Sangrama Nama, Anudinam Vartamanaha Adhyatmika Sangramaha, he says, Devasura Sangrama, that is a God, the battle between, the clash between gods and demons, is the clash which goes on inside the human brain. So that is the human mind. So that is what he says. So heavenly worlds and hell, they are different states of experience. And rebirth, he says, Lokya Deiti Loka. It is not as though there is a heavenly world, some three-dimensional world hanging somewhere. It is a sort of an experiential state which the Linga Sharira or the subtle, subtle body has after the all of the scholar area. So this may be a complicated expression because if you are new to these uh, expressions. So there are several symbolic stories in the Upanishads telling the rivalry between gods and demons. Then again, uh, uh, for example, there are a lot many myths. Uh, this is one particular myth uh, that is Shakti, Goddess Lalita. So if you see Lalita, the picture of Lalita, she is sitting on uh, Shiva. What, what does it mean? Shiva represents that supreme, uh, supreme reality that is infinite consciousness. And the manifesting power is that Lalita. She is sitting on that means that our consciousness is the Adhisthana, the substratum for everything. And basing on that substratum, all this manifestation takes place. So that is one uh, mind again is shown as the sugar cane go. If you see Lalita Sasanama, most of the things, most of the lines are symbolic in nature. Mano Rupa Ikshukodanda, Pancha Tamatra Sayaka, it says Mano Rupa Ikshukodanda, Ikshukodanda means the sugar cane uh, bow. So sugar cane is bow means. That is, the mind is like that um, in, uh, Shukodanta, that is, it gives all the, it is something which is an agency to fulfill all our desires. And five senses are the five arrows which you shoot uh, uh, to external objects. The whole universe is her manifestation. <coughs> then again, if you see Vishnu tradition again, Vishnu again manifesting as Maya, and again Hiranyagarbha, etc. Shiva is shown as the son of Brahma. If you see Vishnu Purana, Shiva is shown as the son of Brahma. Vishnu's son is um, um, Brahma, and Brahma's son is Shiva. So Shiva is pushed down to the third level. So if you see Vishnu Shiva Purana, it is totally different. The hierarchy changes. So that is why uh, when you read Puranas, you have to read with a pinch of salt, as they say. You can take some stories. There are some beautiful stories. For example, Kama Dahana. Kama Dahana is a wonderful story. Kama is Manmatha. Manmatha is turned into ashes when Shiva opens his third eye. So that was the symbolism we have to see. That is, Par Shiva is in a state of, that great state of meditation. Parvati, she wants to attract him by her physical looks. So that, it is, it is not possible. The physical looks, uh, by physical looks, she can't uh, become the uh, consort of Shiva. So it is only by tapas, it is only by severe tapas that she becomes equal to him in that tapas. And then only they can come together. So Shiva is at a higher level and she is at a lower level. With that physical physical um, uh, attraction and all that, she cannot uh, attract uh, Shiva. So that is how that in the uh, Manmata, Manmata's Dahanam, it shows that uh, by uh, elimination of Kama, elimination of Kama, that only produces some uh, good offspring. There are a lot many messages in that story. Right now I can't say. There are a lot many small, small messages. Sir. Then let us see other thing. Story of Prahlada is another thing. So all these things are symbolism. So I think I'll stop here about, I've taken about 40 minutes. So I think uh, you better to answer questions, please. <clears throat> sir, Danyavad, sir, for providing us with a deep understanding, in fact, uh, and, and insight with a new dimension and overview of Smritis, Smritis Puranas, Itihas, Vedas, Upanishads, Sutras, etc. We and and the underlying philosophy which uh, threads through various books of our Sanatana library, I should say. Thank you so much, sir. Dhaniyavat. And uh, I'll, we can leave the uh, for the question and answer session now. To begin with, I'll ask question myself. So, uh, our Sanatana Dharma is 
very complicated and uh, in in fact uh, when you are explaining some of the things i'm i've i've been struggling myself to understand it to the extent that, with the spirit which you are saying so i know there are n number of things which you wanted to say but uh, the time because of time uh, constraints you could not so the complicated things how can we explain this to the kids the children and draw them draw the interest in them to sanatan dharma to follow sanatan dharma and how what is the simplest way to explain the kids such a complicated thing yeah in fact i have written a book i have written a book exclusively how to teach hinduism to your child so this is how it starts so what we have to do is first of all we have to tell them what is religion what is religion religion is basically a belief system suppose you take islam or any, any modern religion any western religion it is basically a belief system oh god is somewhere there and then there is a person called uh, i mean devil and then the god is in constant conflict with that person called devil and then a man is somewhere between in between so there is some story given by a particular person so religion is something which is started by a particular person at a particular point of time with reference to a particular tribe basically the tribal religions and by use of force only they have started so religion is that whereas if you come to hinduism hinduism is both religion and also philosophy basically the the point is the underlying philosophy is from the upanishads and taking that upanishad and with the in the light of that upanishads our our sages they allowed various traditions which already existed in the uh, on the ground for example in for example in that old bharata varsha in that bharata varsha that in right up to gandhara desha right up to kandahar and including burma and all these places so in some place in some area uh, there was a vishnu predominance in some other area there is devi predominance in some other area there is uh, shiva predominance so it was like that so when that was so uh, our, our sages they allowed everything they allowed said okay you follow shiva you follow this that you allow everything but at the end of it don't be content with that you also try to know what you are you try to know what is the highest reality so that is what they said it is not enough if you follow a particular uh, say tradition you follow vishnu tradition but you also come to vedanta you follow this lower level and higher level the lower level is that religion higher level is going beyond the religion and trying to know what we are so that is what our people said so this thing we have to explain what is the, what to normally religions say and what is the difference between indian um, our hinduism and uh the normal western religions so we have to explain them we have to explain to them and uh, if you see my book it, it is uh, much more clear definitely sir if uh, i'll be looking forward for an opportunity to read that book thank you so much then you are the complicated thing is simpler uh, uh I, I don't know. Okay. anyway but of course the subject being so uh, uh, deep and also a lot of understanding Suddenly, we are disconnected to Sanskrit. That is uh, definitely a disconnect, and uh, we are not able to catch up or uh, able to get up to the understanding of. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you if you if you know Sanskrit, it is better. If you do not know Sanskrit, also you can understand Vedanta. It is it's not it doesn't matter. Yeah, but for teaching Vedanta, um, you have to know Sanskrit for teaching. Uh, but understanding vedanta you can understand I, as i told you can listen to sarva priyananda i strongly recommend sarva priyananda to everybody because he is one modern teacher who is uh, creating a lot of impact uh, in the western world there are lot many western people who are also following him and uh, he also has given lot many talks like definition of god for example about satyam gyanam antam i said infinitely existing consciousness he has given some talks on that uh, to iit students and other people So wonderful talks. So you have to listen to that Sarva Priyananda if we want to understand our Vedanta. Thank you. Vedanta is the highest message, and in the light of Vedanta, you have allowed everything, and that is what Gita tells very, very, very clearly. So Gita says, you know the reality, but then a common man, he is following some small, he is following a tradition. Don't disturb him. He says, Joshi is Sarva Karmaani Vidwan Yukta Samajaram. so a simple a simple man he is following some uh, some village he is uh, worshiping some village god or goddess don't go to him and confuse him don't tell him no what you are doing is wrong you are a fool etc etc don't don't uh, say like that let him worship let him be in that path let him become a good person by following any paths very sincerely he becomes a good person by becoming a good person 
then let his curiosity be aroused and then let him come out and then let him know further so don't uh, start with uh, uh, i mean uh, finding fault with people allow everybody to do whatever he wants but then you know what it, what the reality is so that is what repeatedly we see in the gita one small point and the same thing uh, some time back the present swami kanchi swami came to temple skanda temple in padmaravanagar there was a meeting in the context of in the course of the meeting he mentioned that when the constitution was being drafted one team went and met the parmacharya to take his inputs with regard to religion and all that so parmacharya advised them you don't touch religion allow people whatever they are practicing in different places don't touch it it is not up to you they have got it so on reason from roots why they are doing the way they are doing you will not be able to do anything about it so please keep yourself away from that that was advice given to the constitution framers and they seem to have that and what you are mentioning is true they have to right. allow people to pick up whatever they want to do and slowly once they yes. grow out of that you know they can be taken to other levels it is there's a stepping yeah. stone yeah it's a stepping stone yes yes yeah yeah what he said is right from uh, bhagavad gita and also from upanishads na buddhi the shloka is na buddhi bhedam janaye tajnanam karma sankhina joshaye sarva karmani the shloka starts like this na buddhi bhedam janaye suppose somebody is worshiping some god or goddess you should not we should not go and say hey, what you are doing is wrong so we don't we need not interfere let him become a good person by following that then then you tell him how to go beyond that so he is in a position to listen at that time about what vedanta says then when once a person's mind is purified then he is fit for what is called shravana manana nididhyasana shravana means listening to listening and understanding what upanishads say and manana means contemplating logically logically contemplating and seeing what upanishads says is right or wrong then again trying to live right trying to live it suppose upanishad says you are the brahman so i am supposed to live it i am supposed to feel and i am supposed to live it so that is what uh, the, the three uh, three steps shravana manana nidhyasana these things will take place the, this is the higher class but the lower class is religion while following religion i do rituals i go to temples and then break coconuts and then perform all types of rituals that is for normal discipline and again also some things like uh, trying to uh, i mean uh, Um, get rid of my raga dvesha etc may demand minimize minimize or rather get rid of this raga dvesha etc kama krodha loba etc so this is only by practice so this practice of vairagya on one hand and the knowledge on the other these two are like the two wings of a bird which enables this uh, man this human being to fly to that uh, roof top of that building called moksha that is what shankaracharya says vairagya and bodha purushasya pakshivat he says so these two are the wings of this bird and only then the bird will fly so without uh, vairagya if you if you be, if i become a scholar only i just remain a scholar and i i will not be having that realization if i want to have realization i should have both vairagya and also knowledge so that is a very wonderful teaching by our upanishads however brilliant we may be we should not read vedanta on our own uh, at least some preliminary uh, he uh, listening is required after listening to some swamijis in fact i have heard at least half a dozen swamijis on bhagavad gita uh, so we have to listen unless we listen we will not be able to uh, have a complete feel of it uh, so uh, i recommend that sarva priyananda noted sir prashant gar cheptunnaru adugutunnaru what is the first language of vedas is it sanskrit or oral or literature sanskrit only but it is it is called vedic sanskrit because what all sanskrit we see now uh, in ramayana or mahabharata or kalidasa and all these things it is called classical sanskrit what we see in ramayana mahabharata kalidasa and right up right down to the present day it is all called classical sanskrit because what sage vyasa wrote it has not changed even now even if we if even if some modern poet writes poetry he writes in the same way as sage vyasa wrote but the vedic sanskrit is slightly different suppose i tell some vedic mantra uh, something like mitra sajashani dhrutasya odeva sesanasim suppose i say something like that then uh, that cannot be understood by 
a scholar in modern Sanskrit. This is classical Sanskrit. So Vedic Sanskrit and classical Sanskrit, slightly different. But if you get used to that Vedic Sanskrit, where to break and then um, say there are certain particular new terms which are there, new, I mean, diction is there. So it is slightly different. It is Sanskrit only. It is called Vedic Sanskrit. And uh, of course, there are scholars in that also. And uh, because of uh, commentaries by Vidyaranya and other people, we are able to understand the older portions of the Vedas. Modern modern uh, portions of the Vedas are Upanishads. Upanishads can be understood, understood by somebody who knows Sanskrit. Suppose I have studied Sanskrit. I can understand uh, the Upanishads, which are because they are the later portion of the Vedas. The earliest portion of the Vedas are what is called the Samhita portion. The Samhita portion, they are in the old Sanskrit. That is the Vedic Sanskrit. So that is it. And they were not written down. They were not written down, uh, to my knowledge, till uh, this gentleman, uh, Max Muller, came and then got them printed. So what are the, the scriptures or the, the knowledge system which uh, relates to the management part of life, like how to manage life or how to manage state, etc.? Are there particular books which uh, refers to that aspect of life? Yeah, the entire Ramayana, the entire Mahabharata, they only talk about that. Ramayana and Mahabharata, they are all about how to manage life. They may not give the modern um, the terminology, but all the Veda Vyasa makes a challenge. The challenge he makes is, what is there in this book is elsewhere. What is not there here, it is nowhere there, nowhere else. So that means whatever is there in the world, about human nature, it is all contained here. Doesn't mean that all modern science is there. It is not talking about science and technology and all that. About human nature. Uh, so whatever is uh, told in the way of uh, Sage Vyasa's Mahabharata, only that we see elsewhere. And he has not, the, whatever is not there, it is nowhere else outside means. That is, whatever is there in the whole world, he has uh, put it there. So that is how it is. And whether if you see Mah Mahabharata, if you read the Mahabharata, the debates, the ethical debates which are there, it is basically, it is, we, we should not be interested in the story only. We should see the ethical debates. Everywhere there is an ethical debate. So the, the, they are about, um, say, management and everything. What all you call about management, etc., all are contained in that. Thank you, sir. Anybody else who have any questions? Okay, Still, that is in existence or not? I just want to know. According to my gurus, they are not there. According to my, to, I mean, I studied under two eminent people, Tatvavidananda Swami and also another person, Mana Pullala Shramachandradu, and Shankaracharya himself says, Loka, Loka, it is only a state of mind. Lokyate iti Loka, Anubhuyate, I know, Visha Vasya Upanishad, Bhashyam, Shankaracharya, Rasar. Akademundante, Asuriya, Mantra, Visha Vasya Upanishad, Asuriya, 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 Te Loka, Andhe, Natamasa, Vruta, Anubhu, Mantra, Mandi. So, then, Asura Loka, Lundi, Yeti, Anubhundi. Asura Loka, Lundi, Deva Loka, Muda, Asura Loka, Matter. In the Ku, they will come good as a locomotive. They will come low day than the Buddha. You can manam boom panel and pleasures and go with Nama. The New York extension of physical pleasures only are there, is, are there in uh, Devaloka also. So, academy there is, it has nothing to do with Atma Gyanam. No, Sargari Bena Buddha, Sargamla, Atma Gyanam, Sargamla, Uke, Sukaluna, and Tegani, Atma Gyanam, and the Kani, it is as good as Asura Loka and Japanese Shankara Shell, Shankara Shell, Upanishad Tantuni. So, that is Shankara Shell, Hashem Rastu and Rasta do. Empty, Loka and Empty. Loka and it is not a physical world which is there. It is only a state of mind. It is a state of mind. Loka te anubhuyate iti loka hai. Ogadu manu manu jeje twenty panula valla. Our psyche is built up kadan dekhmanu kor psyche anta nanga da. Our hindi linga seriya manu paata paata bhashalo matrada lante manu linga seriya manu samskara alu ivani gorada build up hai thei. So that linga seriya has got certain predispositions, so that a certain way of thinking. So adi it it creates its own loka. So then, then we manu pata lolo kamarasu, sargalo kamarasu. Suppose I am, then I am reading happily, reading Bhagavad Gita every day, and then I am very contented. Then I just tapo lolo kamlo unnatu. Inko bade bade rose, yedo naana kastal bade, naana vadi the TV ni the yedo just unnatu dam konde. Vadi inke yedo paniki mali lolo kamlo unnatu. So something like that. So it is a state of mind. Lolo kamane twenty, it is a state of mind. 
uh, said entire session we could able to uh, get into a deep understanding and then uh, insights today we have seen a completely a total dimensions and sir has touched upon uh, every aspect of how to uh, understand suti smriti puranas vedas itihasas upanishads sutras and each one how they are interlinked and what is the what is the underlying philosophy to read and which goes into the it, it's like a mala and and a thread woven under them and the the simplest way to to have a summary of uh, understanding from the various books if if at all we have uh, we call our sanatana dharma as a library and then he has given us a, a good understanding a summary of how to index uh, the books of this library and into various categories and read each uh, aspect of it and understand more uh, on on listening to bhagavad gita from swami sarvar priyananda uh, dhanyavad sir uh, arvind sir thank you thank you i made a very good summary of what i told thank you